Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. I'm Lucinda Vakura, the Business Development and Marketing Director with the Alfred Group. We're so glad that you're here, and we're thrilled to be uh, co-hosting this webinar with the Community Foundation for Palm Beach and Martin Counties. Uh, Vicki Pugh, uh, the Vice President for Philanthropic Giving uh, with the Community Foundation, will be moderating today's event. Uh, before I turn things over to Vicki, I am going to walk us through a few housekeeping items. So first of all, this webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive a recording of the webinar uh, at the end of today's event. You'll receive an email uh, that will come to your inbox from the Alfred Group that will have a full recording of the webinar for you to reference or to share with friends and colleagues who are unable to make today's event. Uh, this webinar is approved for 1.5 credit points uh, towards your CFRE certification or recertification. So we hope that you take advantage of that. And everyone today joining us is in listen-only mode for the duration of today's webinar. If you do have a question at any time throughout the webinar, uh, all you need to do is chat the question to the panelists. So to do that, if you mouse over the bottom of your screen, a navigation bar should pop up. There's a Q&A icon. If you click on that, it will open a pop-up window and that's where you can uh, type your question to us. It will go to all presenters and panelists. We will answer as many questions as we can at the end of today's presentation uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, and finally, we invite you to join us on Twitter. Uh, throughout the webinar, we'll be live tweeting using the hashtag GivingUSA2020, which is in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, the Alford Group's Twitter handle is at the Alford Group and the foundation's Twitter handle is at CFPBMC. So we invite you to join the conversation there as well. With that, I'm going to hand things over to Vicki to kick us off. Oh, Vicki, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. It's wonderful to have so many people on the call this morning. We had 103 people RSVP, so welcome. We have nonprofit leaders, fundraising professionals, philanthropists, board volunteers, and business and government leaders today. We also have several communication board and staff members listening in on the call. And I do want to give a special shout out to our president and CEO and our board chair, Julie Fisher Cummings, who will be one of our featured panelists later in the call. The last few months have been so incredibly challenging for our non and I just want to take a moment to say thank you to those of you who've elevated and reconfigured services to meet urgent communities caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that many of you have been in, unable to operate, and we're grateful for the creative ways you are maintaining contact with us, with all of us in the community. We can move on to the agenda slide just to go over what we are going to be looking to today. Um, Sharon Tickness from the Alfred Group will be taking us through the Giving USA data from 2019 that came out last month, and we'll have an expert panel discussion around that data. We'll have Q&A, a little bit of a wrap up. So please use the Q&A feature as Lucinda had recommended if you have questions. We're hoping today that we can provide a good overview of landscape in the U.S. and through a conversation with area funders and non leaders make some projections about the future of philanthropy locally. The webinar, as Lucinda said, is a joint project with the Alfred Group, who's been a consulting partner with the Community Foundation for several years, helping us with our strategic plan and impact amplified campaign. Um, a special thank you to Lucinda, who you met earlier, and Casey Miracle from the Community Foundation for helping to put all the logistics on this call together. Let me now introduce my friend and colleague, Sharon Tickness, Executive Vice President and East Division Manager for Group, to take us through the Giving USA data. Thank you, Vicki. Okay. So pleased to be with you and with everyone joining us 
on the webinar today. Um, it's an exciting time in philanthropy. It's an important time in philanthropy. It is an inflection point in philanthropy. And it's a good time to think about what trends we can learn from and where we're going. Um, I'm eager to, to be representing the Alpha Group today. Uh, as you heard Lucinda, my colleague, bringing us on. Also joining us is Jamie Philippi, a wonderful um, colleague who's leading our work with the Community Foundation of Palm Beach and Martin Counties, as well as Amy Hines, who is a Senior Vice President in our New York office. And um, just to give you a sense of what we're going to cover in this segment of the webinar, I'm going to share a little bit about what Giving USA is about and to really slice and dice the data that has emerged through um, this very important philanthropic study and, and look at what the trends are in giving and how economic factors impact giving and what the trends are by giving source and by re recipient type. So um, I hope there's a lot of information in here that will be of interest to you in all the work that you do in our communities. So Giving USA is published by the Giving USA Foundation, which is a part of the Giving Institute. The Giving Institute is comprised of national firms like the Alfred Group, and we're proud that our firm has been a member of the Institute for 30 years and a significant contributor to underwrite the cost of this study. The report is researched and written by the Indiana School Lilly the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. And on our panel today, we have Dr. Sarah Nathan, Assistant Director of the Fundraising School at the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. So what is Giving USA? It is celebrating its 65th year in 2020 of the longest running, most comprehensive, and most authoritative report on charitable giving in the United States. It is a big data project. It covers 128 million households, two, excuse me, 600,000 nonprofit organizations, 80,000 U.S. foundations, and businesses of all sizes. So here was the big headline that we heard just a month ago. Total giving in 2019 in the United States reached $449.64 billion, as you can see, a 4.2% increase in current dollars over giving in 2018, which then totaled $427.71 billion, and an inflation-adjusted dollars, an increase of 2.4%. This giving, um, th this total giving was made to 1.33 million nonprofit organizations. So this is big data, big numbers, big impact. So as we look at the trends in giving over the last 10 years, you can see here that the last three consecutive years have increased giving overall, with philanthropy crossing the threshold of 400 billion in each of the last three years. Looking at it over the last 40 years, um, there, there's a lot of history that we can see in these numbers. The average year-to-year -year change in total giving in these last 40 years was an increase, an annual increase of 10.16 billion, so an average of an increase of 10 billion per year. This year, the increase between 2018 and 2019 was 21.93 million. So you can see, even though that mark at the end looks like a very small mark, that's a larger increase than the average over the last 40 years. Total charitable giving has increased or stayed flat every year since 1979. So as you can see, this line is moving up. It dropped in three years with declines in 1987, a stock market drop we all remember, and in 2008 and 2009, a Great Recession we all remember. The Great Recession ended in 2009, so looking at the most recent decade of 2010 to 2019, total growth in giving was 33%. Philanthropy is growing. Philanthropy is alive and well. 
So as you look at this 40-year snapshot, you can see that we have strong sustainable growth. And in fact, in 2019, all giving sources are either at an all-time high or second all-time high. And on the recipient side, giving in all but three of the charitable subsectors exceeded their previous highs. So while on the one hand, the growth seems moderate, it, has a, it demonstrates a really strong position that we find philanthropy in today, or that we did at the end of 2019. So what are the factors that influence giving? Well, there's several, and these are leading indicators as we think about what are the trends that we can look out today to see where 2020 is going. These factors were important in 2019 and will continue to be in 2020. Personal income grew 4.4% in 20, over 2018, so grew 4.4% in, in 2019. That compares to with 6.1% growth in disposable personal income between 2017 and 18, so slightly less than 2018, but nonetheless 4.4%. Disposable personal income is tied to total household income. It's a key determinant of how households give in many cases. How households give depends on their disposable personal income, the type of income that is available after taxes are paid. Individual giving as a percentage of disposable personal income was 1.9%. So again, among households that gave the percentage of giving as it relates to disposable personal income was 1.9% in 2019, basically level with 2018. You see here the GDP grew 4.1% over 2018. We'll look at why that's important in, in a moment. And the stock market grew 28.9% over 2018. In the fourth quarter, the stock, stock market took a decline, but and recessionary concerns grew, but overall the stock market in 2019 finished strong for the year. So why do we care about how the stock market performs? Well, this chart shows um, the S&P in the gray mark and the total giving in 2019 dollars in the green line. Research has found that statistically there's a significant correlation between changes in total giving and values of the S&P. The stock market is an indicator of financial and economic security that households and corporations compel them to be more likely to give when the stock market is up. This impacts foundations as well. Between 18 and 2019, the S&P 500 grew 26.6%. The direction of change and the robustness of growth in total giving generally lags slightly behind the S&P. The S&P generally sees more dramatic changes from year to year than total giving does, as you can see the difference in these um, hash marks but the rate of change in the S&P over the last 10 years at 8.5 to 27% was significantly higher than the range of giving that, that was between 2.5 and 9.2%. Nonetheless, you can see the correlation between the stock market and giving. So taking a look at the GDP, um, just to remind you all that the GDP is the market value of all goods and services produced within a country's borders during a specific time period and is one of the most important factors in determining a country's economic health. We see here that total giving as a percentage of GDP in both 2018 and 2019 was 2.1%. That seems like a small number, but 2.1% is more than the GDP for utilities, for instance. So when we look at the 40 years that we've been hovering at between 1.6 and 2.1%, it just demonstrates the significance of the impact of philanthropy on the economy, and it helps us to realize how wonderful it would be if we can continue to grow the percentage of GDP as it relates to philanthropy and the impact of the social sector. 
So let's look at the sources of contributions. Um, we all know these four areas, and it's interesting how often um, people come to um, meetings of nonprofit organizations with the assumption that all the money is given by foundations, all the money is given by corporations. But year after year, we see that the power of philanthropy is through individuals, and it's magnified by giving from foundations and corporations. All of these are at, at, at a very strong um, continuation of giving from year to year. As you see here, giving by individuals comprise 69% of total giving. Foundations, which includes grants made by independent, community, and operating foundations amounted to 17% of all gifts. Giving by bequests accounted for 10% of all gifts and giving by corporations 5% of all giving in 2019. And taking a look at this, you see what the rate of change was between 2018 and 2019. So by giving by individuals, up by 4.7%, by foundations, up by 2.5%, by bequests, up really flat, 0.2%, and by corporations, up by 13.4%. We'll take a deeper look now at each of these. So giving by individuals and households totaled $309.66 billion in 2019. Very large mega gifts or gifts by individuals that require an adjustment to the econometric estimate, in other words, gifts more than $300 million, totaled an estimated $6.57 million of, of this total giving. That's up from 2018 when mega gifts totaled $4.8 billion of the total individual giving. You've all likely heard about individuals who've made pledges to the giving pledge, and those are the kinds of individuals that are typically among those making mega gifts. It's important to recognize that giving by individuals represents 69% of all giving, as we see here, and it's the second time that individual giving has dipped below 70%. And I'm sure on our panel today we'll talk about concerns about um, continued giving by individuals and a change in, in number of households who are contributing on an annual basis. When we consider that nearly half of all foundations is family foundations from individuals, and when we add bequests, approximately 88% of total giving comes from individuals. So while this chart shows the snapshot of giving only um, by individual giving, when we put it all together, we understand the importance of nurturing relationships with those who care the most about your work and, and helping to grow the pipeline of our donors and prospects. So taking a look at foundations, 17% um, of total giving in 2019. Independent foundation giving increased by 2.2%. Operating foundations increased by 1.3%. And community foundation giving increased by 5.6%. Giving by family foundations is estimated to be 40%, 46% of foundation giving and comprises 64% of giving by independent foundations. Giving by bequest, as I mentioned before, is somewhat flat in 2019, although you can see here the dramatic growth in giving, by giving through, um, through bequests. Just to break it down a bit, the size of the bequests that make this number up, um, bequests excuse me, estates valued at $5 million and above amounted to $24.77 billion, so roughly half. Um, bequests with estates of 1, 1 to 0.5 million amounted to $7 billion, and estates with assets below a million told $11.43 billion of the, of the $43 billion that was given. 
as we look at this, you can see where there were some big spikes, for instance, in 203 when Joan Crocs estate was distributed, giving 1.5 billion to the Salvation Army, 200 million to NPR, and many other notable nonprofit organizations. The following year, Susan Buffett passed and an enormous amount of her estate was contributed. So we see that bequests have over time been, um, the, the trend in bequests has a lot to do, frankly, with the size of estates that um, are transferred to charitable organizations in that current year. But what's also interesting with bequests come somewhat flattening in, the, in recent years is that perhaps there's a trend of people giving more during their lifetime. Perhaps there's a trend of people um, giving less to their children and having more to give to organizations and being um, inspired by their children to give us a family during their lifetime and to see um, the impact of their philanthropy while they're here to see that. Corporation giving includes cash and in-kind contributions made through corporate giving programs, as well as grants and gifts from corporate foundations. In 2019, charitable giving by corporations increased by an estimated 11.4%. Corporate foundation grant making increased 10.5% in 2019, amounting to $7.52 billion in grants from community, excuse me, from corporate foundations. Despite giving by corporations increasing, as a percentage of total giving, it's remained flat. So as a part of the bigger pie with all four sources of giving, it's remained flat. Various factors relate to an increase in gift in, in, um, gift in kind commitments. Certainly we've seen a tremendous amount of in kind gifting from corporations in this last four or five months, as we do always in times of disaster, for hurricane relief, for fires, there's just a tremendous amount of, of in-kind support that corporations make, which is a part of these numbers that you see. One thing that we also realize is that the GDP increasing by 4.1% in 2018 and the corporate pre-tax pre profits um, staying flat at 0.2% contributes to the ability of corporations to have more cash and more capacity to increase corporate giving. So where did all the money go? Well, here is a breakdown of the recipients of contributions. And you can see here that religious organizations um, received the largest share of charitable dollars in 2019 at 29% of total giving, which has been consistent um, for many years, although giving to religious organizations has declined over time. The education subsector comprised the second largest portion, receiving 14% of total gifts. Human service organizations ranked third in total gifts received at 12% of charitable dollars. Gifts to grant-making foundations, including independent community and operating foundations, is the fourth largest share of charitable dollars at 12% of total giving. The health subsector remained fifth in total gifts and received 9% of charitable giving. The sixth largest portion of charitable dollars is to public society benefit organizations receiving 8%. That includes the United Way, um, many federated Jewish organizations, and those, those kinds of organizations that exist for public society benefit. International Affairs sub sub Subsector ranked seventh in total gifts at 6%. Arts, Culture, and Humanities received the eighth largest portion at 5%, the ninth is environment and animals at 3% of total gifts, and finally, gifts made directly to individuals amounted to 2%, but we realize that this is only the amount of giving to individuals that's captured in reported contributions, not those 
gifts that are also given um, directly but are, don't qualify for a tax deduction, for instance, GoFundMe pages and many other um, ways of giving that have emerged over recent years that aren't tracked as giving to individuals in this report. So just a quick snapshot at giving on a two-year basis to see you know, what the immediate trend is, what we're seeing as, as um, major influencers in 2019 that impacted the various sectors. And as you can see here, arts, culture, and humanities, as well as environment and, the, and animals, as well as education, saw two consecutive years of growth. One contributing factor to these three areas being at, at, at a high level is that high net worth individuals rank these three subsectors as a priority for their funding um, designations. And they've had higher rates of giving to these um, subsectors. And we always see when the market is strong, higher gifts and mega gifts to the arts as well as to education. And typically in years when there's a um, a, a decline in stock market um, performance, gifts to arts and culture and education are not as prolific with those major mega gifts. There's been a two-year growth rate in nine of these subsectors, um, and you know th there's a lot of realities that we know in 2020 will impact how this how this slide will look next year. But in current dollars, we see that between 2017 and 2018, there was a, a, an increase in, in each of these areas, except for a slight decrease in inflation-adjusted dollars for public society benefit. So how do you like this slide? Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> There's a lot of data here. It tells a big, big story, and I'll try to make it, um, um, it informative to you. Um, you know, it is important to look at what's happening to different sectors over time and to see what's emerging as being a priority and giving as directed by philanthropy. So. Um, as we look at the last four decades, again, um, as I mentioned, giving to religious organizations has been declining as a share of total giving to recipient organizations um, since the five-year period beginning in, in 1985. So it reached 56.4% in 1985, and in the last five-year period, religious um, giving comprised 30.5%, so going from 56.4% in 1985 to 30.5%, and this year um, even, even less. Um, education subsector has received between 11 and 14% of total contributions in the past four decades. It has been at its strongest in the last four or five year periods. So you can see how education has grown. And as we hear often about mega gifts to universities across the country. The share of total giving to human service organizations has stayed relatively stable for five year periods beginning in 2010 at 12.5% um, growth. Giving to the subsector was a single digit percentage um, for five years beginning in 2080, excuse me, in 1980, 1985, 1990, and 1995, but it rose to 11 and 13% in the last two decades. And no doubt this year, um, giving to human services has definitely taken a higher priority. Giving to public society benefit sector um, has been between 6 and 8% in the last four years, and um, we see an increase in this as this is also where gifts to um, donor advice funds and fidelity and other areas is often is tracked. So that's where gifts to commercial donor advice funds is tracked. International affairs um, has been tracked since 1987 and um, is experiencing an, an, an increase and also giving to environment and animals. So we have a fantastic panel that we're all eager to hear 
And I'll just leave you with these um, short closing, closing thoughts. You know, this data helps us to examine how um, our organizations are working through a historical lens and to think about what the future is showing. Um, we know that influencers that will impact giving in 2020 include the pandemic, the economy, the elections, and societal shifts. People often wonder how does a presidential year election impact giving? Well, as a portion of giving, it, it has a very small impact because political giving comes out of a, a, a different um, slice of, a, of, of giving than, than charitable giving, and it's a very small um, amount of giving by compared to overall charitable giving. We know the stock market is a factor, and while we had a big drop in March, we had an increase in April and May, although June was flat, and we, we don't have a crystal ball on that. But we know that um, the most important things we can be doing is to be bold about the essential nature and impact of every nonprofit's work, um, to tell your story in um, a way that demonstrates what's essential and extraordinary about what you do, to utilize technology in new ways, not only in how we're communicating right now on this um, presentation, but also in analyzing information. We have access to so much more information about giving, but also about how we measure impact in our organizations. So keep your mission forefront, stay bold, and keep connected. Let's make sure that we do everything we can to bring um, strength and, and, um, and inspiration to philanthropy in the years to come. Vicki, back to you. Thank you, Sharon. That was a wonderful overview of the Giving USA data for 2019, and thank you especially for your optimism at the end of your remarks. We are going to move along to our panel. I have the great pleasure of introducing them, good friends and colleagues who've distinguished careers working in and with the philanthropic sector. I might even call them a dream team. So I'd like to ask all of them to unmute their phones and turn their videos on. Um, and I'm going, as I introduce them, I am going to ask each of them some pointed questions. I'm going to encourage all the panelists to chime in, even if I don't call on you to answer. And I might throw in a question or two, but it will be related um, to what we've talked about today. So please allow me to introduce our first panelist, Julie Fisher Cummings who is a philanthropic leader and volunteer who passionately advocates for responsible policies around health, education, and philanthropy on behalf of underserved and marginalized children and families. She has dedicated over 40 years to civic leadership locally and nationally through her positions at many prestigious institutions and has forged effective public-private partnerships and new funding networks in Florida and across the U.S. Welcome, Julie. Our second, panelist is, our second panelist is Eric Kelly, who served as president of Quantum Foundation. Many people in our community know Eric and the Quantum Foundation as the largest health funder in our county. He's a community leader who works tirelessly across the business, nonprofit, and public sectors to advance sustainable improvement initiatives often involving technology and innovation, and benefiting young people from underrepresented groups in healthcare. Welcome, Eric. Dr. Sarah Nathan is an Associate Director at the Fundraising School, the nationally resound, renowned professional training program for fundraising practitioners at the Indiana University Lilly Family School of Philanthropy. Sarah is a true pracademic developing and supporting curriculum and teaching it from the perspective of a seasoned researcher, community fundraising, and volunteer leader. Welcome, Sarah. And our fourth panelist is Brian Wodar, Senior Vice President and Financial Advisor with Bernstein Private Wealth Management in West Palm Beach. He served on several local boards, and his areas of expertise include investment strategy, retirement planning, wealth transfer, 
concentrated stock and option exposure, business sales, and philanthropic giving. So welcome, Brian. So I'm going to kick off the questions, and we'll get going again. If you all on the call have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A feature, and there'll be a Q&A session uh, monitored after this panel discussion. So we're going to start with Sarah. Based on the momentum that the sector experienced coming into 2020, and given this current fairly uncertain fundraising environment, what surprised you or concerned you about the 2019 Giving USA data? Yeah, thanks, Vicki, for the opportunity to be with all of you today and to the Alfred Group. Um, it really is an honor to represent my colleagues at the Lilly Family School, who really spend all year, all year, crunching this data to put this report together. So we're really proud of that, and I'm happy to be here. Um, uh, one, one surprise and kind of I want to amplify one thing uh, from the report. Uh, the first surprise for me was that all subsectors grew in 2019 after a rel relatively volatile 2018. So usually when we see this report, we see all the subsectors go up or they all go down. But in 2018, it was all over the map, all over the board in 2018. Uh, and that was kind of puzzling uh, for us to kind of understand that. So it was great to see that almost every sub subsector rebounded in 2019. That is really positive and exciting. Um, just that international subsector saw um, kind of a flat or decline in 2019. Uh, and we know that giving to the international subsector is largely driven by natural disasters. So when, the, when there are those kind of big natural disasters, that fuels a lot of giving um, outside of the United States. Um, so I think that's a really positive thing. I wanna amplify one other thing that Sharon mentioned, which is the power of individuals uh, in philanthropy. And, you know, I, I saw s some of you, even in the comments, were saying like, oh, that's so eye-opening for the board. And I would encourage you to use that piece of data with your board to help them understand uh, the power of individuals in giving. And of course, we're only capturing formal giving, that, that kind of those formal um, charitable gifts that we can track via IRS data, via organizational data, um, but that does not capture all of the informal caring and giving and helping behaviors that uh, happen in neighborhoods, in communities, in families. Um, and, you know, I, I always want to remind us of that to just remember this full picture of generosity and how we as fundraisers can activate the generosity of others. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean all of our, everyone has to write a check or has to be a mega donor or a major donor. Uh, but there are things that we can do to celebrate and capture um, and inspire generosity in lots of ways. And I think that we're, we're seeing a lot of that informal giving you know, since the pandemic and uh, how we're helping our communities and our neighbors. Uh, and let's celebrate that too. Thank you, Sarah. One quick question. Um, will the COVID-19 pandemic, the giving to that, would that fall in the international disaster category as we're tracking that so closely for 2020? Um, so yeah, so our research team at the school is working on like six different projects <laughs> related to giving to, to COVID-related activities. So, so those um, organizations that are primarily doing work outside of the United States, that would be captured in international giving. Um, we know a lot of the COVID uh, giving that's happening is going to um, kind of like scientific research. So that might be captured in the healthcare uh, subsector. It might be captured in higher ed since some of that is going to academic medicine and academic medical center. So I think that that giving is going to kind of be um, it's probably spread out among some of the various subsectors. Uh, one of the projects our research team is, is also tracking is crowdfunding of, of crowdfunding of campaigns of $100,000 or more that are related to COVID relief. And that also could be all over um, the subsectors that are kind of working in that, the, that relief area and uh, the recovery area. So I think we're gonna probably see that in a represented in multiple subsectors. 
Thank you for that perspective. Brian, um, you study economic trends all the time every day as you're working through your client list, um, answering their questions. So anything jump out at you um, in the survey data? Uh, thank you. Sure, Vicki, thank you. And also thank you to the Community Foundation and the Alfred Group for the opportunity to be here today. It's a great panel. It's an honor to be on it. Um, so yeah, um, I've got, uh, I look, I look through the data and I feel like there's some things to be concerned about and, and then reasons to be optimistic about it. So the concern that I have is if you look back at the 07, 09 data, you'll see that obviously charitable giving dropped, but it took, according to the Giving USA data, it took until 2014 to return to the peak level of giving from 2007. That's a seven year gap, a long time. Um, and the, you know, that obviously was driven by a recession that, it affected, that affected the entire planet. And I think we can agree that we're in the middle of a similar recession that's going to affect and already has affected the entire planet. Um, by many measures, GDP is expected to grow, uh, is expected to drop by greater levels this year than occurred during uh, the 2007-2009 recession. Um, clearly, we expect to see personal income on average around the country to decline. Um, so, so this is a concern, and this is a reason that we might expect to see charitable giving decline at a time when I think we can agree it is probably in greatest need. Um, that being said, I think the reason to be optimistic is one of awareness. You know, when we were dealing with the financial crisis 10 years ago, a little more than that, clearly there were people hurting, but there wasn't the global social media awareness of issues facing folks who are losing health care. Um, they're suffering with food insecurity. There's obviously social equity issues that are all over the news, all over your social media feed, let's say every day of the week. And it could be, and I hope, that it's that awareness that will drive people to um, perhaps tighten their purse strings a little bit, but hopefully a lot less than they did in 2007, eight and nine. Uh, we, we clearly don't know how that will play out. Um, and I'm hopeful that uh, you know uh, Americans and, and others will really answer the call and help the folks who are in the greatest need at the time when they're in the greatest need. Yeah, I think we all are feeling um, optimistic on that too, Brian, as we see uh, great philanthropists making big commitments to organizations responding to the 19 pandemic right now. So speaking of, let's talk to a couple of funders about what they're seeing. Um, how are you approaching philanthropy differently, Eric? to address the COVID-19 urgent needs in our community. Well, Vicki, to, uh, to frame my comments, I want to share uh, an analogy. I, I worked at a time in my life for the Franciscan Sisters of Allegheny. Working for the nuns was quite the, uh, quite the treat. But they would often share the analogy of the river to talk about the difference between upstream and downstream approaches to, to uh, an equity or equity or building community. And, it's, it's a bit of a story. It's a story about a small town, and at the small town, there were children playing out by the river. And one day, the children saw a body floating down the river. They ran into town, grabbed the town's folks, and said, there is a, 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 a corpse in the river. By the way, this is really not breakfast conversation, but it, it, it helps to frame, the com frame my comments. So to make the, the, the analogy much shorter than it really is, at the end of the analogy, Finally, one of the children said to all, the townspeople and to all who were there, let's go upstream and see what's affecting life at the top of the river. Because in the analogy, they had become accustomed to pulling the bodies, the corpse, out of the river at the base or the bottom of the river versus going up to see what was happening. So from that, we at Quantum Foundation, as part of our strategic plan, which our board approved uh, March 17th, just before quarantine, we have what we call upstream and downstream approach to health and well-being and to community wellness, COVID-19. There were three things that we did uh, immediately. And as it has been in the past, Quantum Foundation's board and staff, uh, we think uh, very logically, we think uh, very intelligently, as well as we act responsibly and immediately to these kinds of issues. Three things we did. Number one, 
uh, we made additional funding available through uh, our grant making for COVID-19. And this was something that our board did immediately. And with that, we had a particular focus on testing. Uh, because in the earliest days, the testing, we were still figuring it out as a society and this community. Uh, and so what we did, we moved into action to coordinate with many of our federally qualified health center partners and leading the charge was Found Care uh, Health Center. We went out into the communities and we're doing what was called pop-up and mobile testing. And primarily using a, a, a mapping system we have here at Quantum Foundation called PolicyLink, we went in and we looked, at, looked for the communities where the virus was going to have the, the, the greatest or the most negative impact. And we went out into those communities and we made funding available for that. The second thing we did, in addition to the mobile and pop-up testing in communities of, of, that were underserved, medically underserved, was that we also advanced and made available to our small, we call grantee partners in our community, quantum in the community, grantee partners, we made available resources for basic needs, food and sheltering, uh, housing assistance, rent assistance, utility assistance. And so we made those funds available for general operating support. And that was important because much of what we know was at the base or at the bottom of the river, rather at the bottom of the river, uh, there's a lot of basic need. Uh, and so we had to get to the basics and that was making sure that some of those our grassroots partners, smaller organizations who are mighty and powerful were available and able to do that. And the third thing that we did was we looked at our current grantee uh, agreements and we, we made those very flexible. Many of our grantee partners said, hey, we need dollars for general operating support, although this was a programmatic uh, funding engagement. Well, we knew that many of those projects were in person and that was changing and therefore we were able to make uh, the flex we were flexible enough to say, you know, we, we want those dollars to be spent in the best way possible. So those were the three things, Vicki, that we did. We made funding available specifically for testing in medically underserved communities and places where we would see historic disinvestment and, and health uh, disparity. Uh, grassroots funding was made to our org grantee organizations who work really at the heart of community. And the third thing was we were flexible with the contracts that we already had with many of our community partners. Great, great. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for your thoughtful approach um, to helping so many people in the community who need it. Um, Julie, you're on the front lines of philanthropy, and you've done so much funding in response to some of the organizations uh, that really need us in, in this community and others. So share with us a little bit of how you're approaching your funding for COVID-19 causes. Well, thank you so much. Um, I also want to thank my um, other panelists here, and uh, particularly um, Eric Kelly, who's on the, um, he's really on the front lines addressing it. And as a philanthropist, particularly through the Community Foundation, we did the same thing and relaxing some of the supports um, that we intended in terms of reporting and allowing them to use it for general operating support. In addition, I think this is a time that in particularly there's a bolder vision for philanthropy, uh, for us to educate, inform, and listen. And remember those closest to the ground uh, are affected and that we need to, they know the issues the best. Finally, we, I think it's a call to move beyond a charity mindset into a social justice mindset. You know, charity is transactional and it helps people survive, whereas social justice helps them thrive. And it helps create sustainable, long-term equitable solutions. So on the one hand, we're funding directly, but we're also looking at the big picture on how we can help build capacity for our organizations. And we did this particularly through the Funders Collaborative, um, where the Community Foundation helped create this um, common app so we knew which issues were on the ground and we could talk to our partners so we made sure that there weren't gaps and we weren't overfunding some issues while others were getting nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. So, Brian, um, you work with philanthropists every day, clients of yours, uh, about their giving. We, we know from history, uh, from a historical perspective and some of the groups that we have, Wealthy individuals really come come to give more during these disasters and and COVID nineteen. So, uh, hearing from your clients as they're responding. Great, yeah, and and you're absolutely right, Vicky. Um, it's funny, you know, when I look at my client base and the folks who are philanthropically inclined, 
there's kind of a dichotomy right now. There's kind of a split where um, there's a large group of them who are recognizing, hey, if there's ever a time to be more generous, more philanthropic, invest more in the community, it's now because people are in the greatest need now. So there are certainly folks who are increasing their annual giving by a, mar by, by a recognizable margin. Um, and, and uh, you know, that's, that's wonderful news. But there are also other folks who, you know, one of the things that's really important is to understand how much of my wealth that I have do I need to support myself and how much of that is excess. And so that's a, uh, an exercise I go through with my clients quite a lot. And there's plenty of folks who, you know, they've got just the right amount. They can afford a moderate amount of charitable giving on a regular basis, and they do. But when an event like this occurs and they see their wealth dip and then bounce back, not all the way, but, but bouncing back, it makes them a little more hesitant to be as generous as they normally would be. And so, like I said, there's a dichotomy. There are some folks who are definitely um, dropping more in the hat on a regular basis and some folks who are doing less so. I, I'm also seeing um, a split between folks who are making gifts that are very well focused on specific programs um, and others that are, are unrestricted. Um, there are some folks who are saying, hey, this charity that I know and trust, um, they've got this specific program that addresses this specific issue that I care the most about right now, and they're making gifts directly to that. But there's, in my experience, there's a growing number of folks this year who are saying, you know what, I trust this charity, I know their leadership, I've invested my, uh, my time and money with them in the past, I'm just going to trust them to do what's best with these dollars now because they're, uh, to, as Julie said, they're on the ground, they see where the issues are, um, and they're gonna be well positioned to make those decisions. I, some other things that are changing or will change throughout the year, you know, as a result of the tax law that was passed, the CARES Act that was passed a few months ago, um, nobody in the United States who has an IRA is required to take a distribution from their IRA. And one of the most favorite strategies that charities approach their philanthropists with is to make that tax-free gift directly from your IRA to your favorite charity. But since nobody has a required distribution from their IRA this year, um, the tax savings for doing that this year is literally zero. And so there's clearly less of an impetus for folks to be making distributions from their IRAs. The second favorite strategy is to make gifts of appreciated assets. Well, the number of appreciated assets out there today are somewhat smaller than they were a few months ago. And that is also going to uh, be a reason why people will be giving less of that. However, the CARES Act also has this really wonderful uh, point to it where gifts of cash to charities, not to your donor advised fund, not to a private foundation, but gifts of cash to your charity are eligible this year for a charitable income tax deduction up to 100% of your adjusted gross income. So while I expect to see less giving from IRAs, less giving of appreciated assets, I expect to see as the year rolls out more cash giving. Um, and, and so that's, that's the kind of trends that I've been seeing and that I expect to see for the rest of the year. That's great, Brian, and for, and Julie, perhaps you can answer this question. Um, for some of those clients that Brian has and from you personally making some special gifts right now to organizations that are addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, um, are these going to be kind of one and done type gifts or do you anticipate now that you're more aware maybe of some of these organizations you'll continue to give um, quite generously. Yes, um, thank you so much. I think what's happened is there's a call for more localized philanthropy. People are getting closer to the issues and I think they're finding it more satisfying. It creates some, what are this heart connection and it's driven a great deal by data too. Uh, people wanna know that the impact they're having is informed by that data. I think this will change my grant making. Um, because I wanna become more informed about the issues, but it's also, also the systemic issues and how they may be addressed. Um, I also find that people like to work in organizations that are work collaboratively with each other, either through alliances 
and trusting that they have the information on the ground. So it's really about educating, using data, and becoming more lo localized. Um, and it all goes into creating a web of support and knowing that every person can matter. I think that what's happened a lot through this, and I've heard it spoken about too through crowdfunding, is that the whole t issue and the field of philanthropy has become flattened and everybody can make a difference whether they give $1 or one hour of time to like a million dollars. And each one is important for these local organizations. Thank you. That was a great answer, Julie. That helps some of us in the nonprofit world to kind of think about how we're approaching donors. And maybe Sarah could give us a little more feedback. How do we keep these donors that are organizations for the first time through this pandemic to, to continue supporting us? Yeah, well, I, I already mentioned the importance of individual donors and you, this, the data speaks for itself and why we believe at the fundraising school that investing in a individual giving program at your organization is time well spent uh, because that donor that period of donor engagement takes a while it takes some time for for donors as, as julie just described to learn about the issues become deeply connected and so as organizations we need to think creatively about how we can help our donors learn and grow in their philanthropy and come to trust us. Brian also mentioned that, that you know, he's working with individuals who are making larger gifts to organizations they already know and trust. And again, that takes a period of time, of engagement over time um, to help those donors trust us so that when we are facing a crisis like we are now, they feel comfortable just making that gift, um, with, you know, with, without, without thinking twice about it. Um, so, how, so how do we do that? I mean, that, that is thinking creatively over time. How, how can we do that? How can we do that now in a time of social distancing, uh, wearing masks? How can we do that virtually? I, organizations are, are doing this really creatively. I was, I was talking to a woman who runs a, a museum yesterday and she said, well, how do, I, how do I just call this longtime donor? He sends me a Christmas card every year. And I said, when, why don't you just call him and do a little video chat and give him a behind the scenes tour of the museum? Oh yeah, I can do that. Yes, you can do that. Uh, help your donors um, get a sneak peek during this time. Have a video chat, have a phone call. I think the good old fashioned phone is making a comeback. Handwritten <laughs> letters are making a comeback. Um, those are all those special touches, again, that enhance trust. Uh, so spending some time with your individual donors, those donors who you think might have potential to make a major gift later this year, next year, that is time well spent. Old-fashioned phone call. That's a great tip for today. Thank you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. So, Eric, as we're looking at the nonprofit organizations, kind of speculating what the future might be coming out of this pandemic, which is this pandemic, right? Um, what kind of headwinds should our nonprofit organizations be anticipating, and and you know, how will you shape your giving around that? Well, before I answer your question, Vicky, Sarah, I'm. I want to say to you that I am pleased to hear that the old phone call is making a comeback. And if the phone call is making a comeback, then I am truly a leader because I went back to a flip phone. <laughs> this is the comeback. Love it. Love it. So, Vicki, um, three things. Um, well, before that, too, also, I, Julie says something that, that just can't, I mean, We've got, we've got to pay attention to this. And this is what I believe all of our colleagues, I grew up in the nonprofit sector here in Palm Beach County, came into this community now over a quarter of a century ago. I love saying things like that because I feel so much more mature, a quarter of a century ago. Uh, so over 25 years ago, I came into this community and, and as a nonprofit worker. And, and so I, I, many of the nonprofit leaders who are on this, this, this webinar know me and know that. And so number one, one of the things I love about the sector here is not only the resilience, but the forward thinking and the flexibility, the agility. So the headwinds won't really do much uh, to, to, to create barriers for our, our nonprofit community.
But the most important thing I believe that our community needs to hear is what Julie said, and I'll repeat it, that we educate, inform, and listen. We gotta listen. We must listen. Philanthropy must listen. Nonprofit leaders must listen. Community has to speak. Individuals have to speak. Residents have to speak. Not us speaking for them, not us speaking about them, not us doing to them, nothing about them without them is the phrase oftentimes we use. The other thing that Julie said that, that we've all got to embrace is we've got, we've got to think about this movement between, I'll call it a continuum, but a movement between charity and justice. Julie, I love the way you framed it. Charity helps people survive in these emergent needs. Justice, social justice, help people to thrive. And that's looking at the systemic and structural issues of, of our communities. And that's when I go back to the river analogy. Downstream are all of the things that we call charity. These are the emergent things. These are the things that people need right now. They're, they're in survival mode, food, shelter, emergency assistance, utilities. This is all charity. These are things that we do to keep people and allow them to stay in this survival mode. And I believe as nonprofit leaders, we have to think about the difference between charity, social justice, and the continuum, and the river, because I think of it again as the river. Upstream, when we look upstream, the things that are killing and destroying and really maiming the communities that we care about so deeply are the social justice issues and the systemic issues. Those are the things that when we get upstream and dismantle those barriers and structures, those are going to be the things that cause communities to thrive. Um, I, I would posit, and, and I, I, would, I would say to our colleagues in the nonprofit sector, leaders in the nonprofit sector, and I still consider myself, I am a nonprofit guy, um, we've got to think about that. We've got to be able to speak really clearly about the difference between charity and justice. Upstream, social justice. Downstream, charity. The difference between survival mode and thriving mode. Because as Julie and Sarah and Brian, as we all have said, donors and philanthropists are looking for data. They want to know, are we moving a needle in terms of charity? Uh, are we just working in charity? Or are we moving a needle in terms of social justice? Are we going upstream? And if I had my way, I'd, I'd educate every donor to have that same conversation with nonprofit leaders. Our community, our people deserve that. They deserve that conversation. So number one, I'd say the thing, and it's not really a headwind, it's old fashioned, not-for-profit leadership, um, community engagement, more conversations with neighbors and in neighborhoods. More foundations are now going to the neighborhoods. More foundations, one of the things we did here at Quantum, uh, we have now a director of community engagement, Shannon Hawkins. That's because we want to go directly to the community. We want to hear from the community. We want to hear the data coming from the data source herself, himself. And, and so I, I know that our, our nonprofit partners are already doing that. I'd say pay more attention to number one, community engagement. Number two, I'm just going to go back to my upstream, downstream. And one of the things that will be required of Quantum Foundation uh, grantee partners moving forward is a conversation about where are you in this river, in this spectrum of downstream. And it's going to be important that we do that. We'll continue to do it. As a matter of fact, we have Quantum in the community, a very successful program where we focus on our grassroots partners. We'll continue to do that downstream, emergent, charity, people are in survival mode, grant making. And we'll also look upstream at some of the structural barriers and the systemic issues that keep certain people in that downstream panic mode. And so I believe it's incumbent upon us as nonprofit leaders and those of us in the field to have that understanding uh, and then lastly, I know that we all know this now because here we are on this Zoom platform. Our nonprofit partners will obviously understand that technology and the use of technology is mm -hmm. going to be and is already a way forward, but we're going to have to figure that out more and more. And I would suspect that as grant makers, we will have to get comfortable uh, funding more technology or technological advancements for our uh, partners who are doing the work as our nonprofit leaders. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Eric, great, great uh, suggestions for all of us to be thinking about, especially that community, community engagement piece. Um, I think let's move on to Sarah. Um, kind of based on what Eric was saying, what do you see as growth opportunities for profit? So many of us have kind of been in the survival mode for the past 
four to six months, where are the growth opportunities? Especially with those individual donors, we are seeing um, some growth opportunities with donor advised fund holders. So those individual donors who might do all or some of their giving through a donor advised fund. And I saw a question earlier either in the chat or in the Q&A about those donor advised funds. Um, we're seeing a movement called Half My Daft, where some donors are committing uh, a significant portion of their donor advised fund. And we also saw early in the pandemic when, you know, there, there was a lot of uncertainty for, uh, for everyone um, that donors could act quickly from their donor advised fund um, to, to give th through that kind of pot of money. Um, and I think that that is going to be um, Part of the reason that donor advice funds are, are a great vehicle for donors because in a, you know, maybe last year they weren't sure what to give to and then all of a sudden there's this immediate need and that they could give immediately out of their donor advised fund. Um, I think that that is part of the case for, for why that's such a great vehicle. Um, for donors. So if, you know, talking to your donors, do they have a donor advised fund? Maybe calling and rethinking your donors who are giving through their do donor advised fund, uh, reminding them of uh, the good work that you're doing in this time, uh, using it as an opportunity, as Eric said, to inform and educate uh, about the work, make your case for support uh, to these individual donors. Um, and I'll reiterate something that, that Brian said earlier that, you know, we, we do know from the, that 50 plus year of Giving USA that recessions do depress overall giving, but of course it's not uniform among all of our donors. So uh, we need to keep in contact with our individual donors because not all of them, uh, many of them are, are giving as Eric or as Brian described. So again, calling them, doing a video chat, doing a video tour, um, that there are those opportunities to educate, inform, connect, and engage those individuals. We keep hearing individual giving it is. So thank you, Sarah, for those words. Uh, mm -hmm. Brian, I know you have a crystal ball and it's very reliable. Well, it's pretty reliable most of the time. But tell us a little bit about economic trends. What is gonna happen? Are we gonna are we gonna have this great surge of recovery or if it's gonna take a long period of time like we saw in the Great Recession between 2007, 2014? What what are you anticipating? So um, it's a great question. Um, you know, we were clearly looking at a moment where unemployment is at levels that are uncomfortable regardless of how you look at them. Um, plus, uh, I believe this is the final week of the federal uh, $600 a week unemployment insurance. So, um, you know, we are quickly approaching a moment where folks who have been furloughed or outright put out of work, um, who really have been struggling to literally put bread on the table and literally keep a roof over their heads, that, you know, barring some major uh, announcement from Washington, D.C., are really going to face substantially larger hardships literally as soon as next week. And, and so, you know, from, an, from a very near-term economic perspective, um, you know, the, the not-for-profits that are supporting folks that have uh, food insecurity and housing insecurity and healthcare insecurity, they are about to be called on substantially larger than they have been even up until now. Um, and, uh, and, you know, th there's, there's an, a ripple effect of all of this where, you know, if, if all of a sudden um, someone is not able to pay their rent, what happens? Does the landlord, uh, if, if they're allowed to, given the county or state they live in, does the landlord ask that family to leave the house? Or does the landlord keep the people on who aren't paying rent? Either one of those is a bad outcome. Obviously, it's worse for the family if they're out on the street. If they're in the home, but they're not paying rent, then what does the landlord do? Often, landlords are taking that rent to pay the mortgage on the home. So now the landlord might stop paying the mortgage. And now, if you have a real tidal wave of landlords not paying mortgages or homeowners who are out of work and don't have unemployment insurance, stop paying their mortgage, 
That is when it starts to really thoroughly infect the lending and the banking system. And we saw a very exaggerated example of that in 2007 and 8 and 9. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we're heading in that direction, but but there will be knock-on impact. So that is a very big near-term, very near-term economic impact that will be uh, hopefully averted in the coming days uh, by the folks in Washington, D.C. Um, longer term, um, you know, we've got uh, uh, unemployment at, in the double digits right now. Um, the, the consensus estimate is that uh, unemployment will subside to the high single digits sometime next year. You know, that's eight or nine percent. Um, and, you know, eight or nine percent unemployment relative to today is great. Relative to where we were six months ago is awful. Relative to the families who are out of work, it's a catastrophe. Um, and so, so this is going to be an ongoing issue that's going to face us economically financially for many years to come. Um, uh, I've seen estimates where, you know, the expectation is we'll get back to full employment, which is unemployment in the range of three and a half, four and a half, five percent. Um, we'll get back there in three years, maybe four. And there are some estimates that say even longer than that. That's a long time. Um, and that's going to have this uh, ongoing impact on the economy and on not-for-profits that support these people. By the way, other things on the uh, big picture economic perspective, um, interest rates are effectively at all-time lows. And the, you know, when you look at folks who are considering charitable strategies, um, some of the more popular ones are charitable gift annuities and charitable remainder trusts. Um, some people will say, well, charitable gift annuities and charitable remainder trusts are less attractive when interest rates are low, and I don't think that's true. But there is an unattractive part to it, which is that the lower interest rates are, the less of a charitable income tax deduction you get for creating a charitable gift annuity. But the lower interest rates are, the lower interest you're earning on your cash, on your bonds. And if you can trade in your cash or your bonds for a charitable gift annuity or a charitable remainder trust, which might be paying you three times, four times, five times the rate of income that you're getting on cash or bonds, well, that's a very attractive trade-off. And so, uh, you know, that, that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Vicki, perhaps you know someone in the community who offers charitable gift annuities. We'll come back yeah. to that later. Um, also, um, while they're not used terribly frequently, charitable lead trusts are much more attractive when interest rates are low. And so with interest rates, the interest rate that governs uh, charitable lead trust is called the Section 7520 rate. It is literally at an all-time low. It is almost zero. It is less than one half of 1%. Um, and so funding new charitable lead trusts in today's environment can be really attractive. Uh, finally, from an economic perspective, there is um, there is a sense that come November, there will be a Democratic sweep in Washington, D.C. That is that you'll have a Democratic president, a majority Democratic uh, Senate, and a majority Democratic House of Representatives. Should that occur, I think we should expect to see that the tax cuts that were passed three years ago, um, which are scheduled to sunset in 2025, I think we can all expect to see those tax cuts reduced or eliminated. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to say when. I don't know if it'll be early in 2021 or late in 2022, but that's almost certainly something that will be on the short list for um, a Democratic um, Washington, D.C. And, and so from that perspective, when that happens, when tax rates are higher, it means that the value of charitable income tax deductions gets higher also. So um, I'm not familiar with many people who are in favor of higher taxes, but that is a silver lining on that dark cloud. Uh, so those are some things I'm seeing in the economy near term and long term. Great. Thank you, Brian. Um, lots for us to think about as we navigate through the next year um, following this pandemic. We have a time for one last question and then a quick lightning round, but Julia, we know about so much of the urgent needs that have surfaced during the COVID-19 pandemic. What other needs are you seeing in the community? Maybe 
I don't want to call them secondary needs. They're probably all urgent. Keep your attention on what here in our local community. Well, I would just, I know we have very little time left, but I just, I don't think it's, I think as Brian said, it's not just one issue, it's a continuum of issues and each one is, impacts the other one. It's like this building blocks. We have the basic needs, but we also have housing, childcare, domestic violence. How are people gonna go back to work if childcare is impacted? I've heard that childcare, um, these child care centers have COVID positive people are serving them. Then the kids, this is what's happening at camps right now. It, it's going to happen at school. So we're going to have to figure out and be very creative. Maybe we do child care over Zoom. I mean, I think we have to think of very um, creative ways to address this. And truly the issue that Brian was picking up about housing. Diana Stanley, who's head of the Lord's Place, and I know you all know, always says the answer to homelessness is housing. But how do we pay for that housing? Providing low cost housing, thinking of creative ways to do that. And really finally, the it all comes down to the issue of capacity building for our partners on the ground, these impact organizations. I don't want to take up any more time. I know we're sort of running late. Thank you. It's great, Julie. Just very quickly, lightning round starting uh, with Brian, then Sarah, Eric, Julie, a couple words to finish us up. What should we be thinking about um, as we continue the next days, next months, et cetera, and, and philanthropy for the next year? Um, anytime we're in a crisis, you hear the same four words, uh, this time it's different, and that's usually not true. Uh, the better four words are, this too shall pass. And what, the reason I mention that is if you as an individual or as a not-for-profit have set up a prudent investment strategy and you did so before this crisis, then you should stick with that investment strategy and not run for the hills when volatility shows up. Instead, you should stay invested. You should have a rainy day fund on the side so that you don't have to be selling out of stocks while you're dealing with volatility. Um, and for not-for-profits, I thoroughly encourage you to adopt or stick with their smoothing policy from a spending perspective. When we're dealing with this kind of volatility in your investments, the smoothing policy allows you to have very little volatility in your spending, which is really what matters most. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah. I want to say that fundraisers are my people, and um, I have spent mo you know much of my career working as a fundraiser and supporting fundraisers. And we know from the research about the profession that one of the characteristics that make fundraisers successful is positive positivity, a positive attitude. So um, I just want to lift that up. Uh, and uh, encourage us all to see the opportunities that are around us. And I do believe that there are opportunities to reimagine what our organizations have to offer, reimagine how we're telling our story, making our case, and ensuring that we are relevant in a post-pandemic world. So stay positive and see the opportunity. Thank you, Sarah. Eric? I'll take that baton. Let's be hopeful and let's be civil. Mm -hmm. oh. Excellent words. How about you, Julie, to close this out? Yes, thank you. Um, I want to um, thank really our nonprofit or impact organizations on the ground. You've been the working overtime to address these burgeoning needs with less staff or the same staff and just working. And I find with Zoom, you work 100 times more than you would normally. <laughs> and I want to thank you all for doing that. I would say, think of the different creative ways to um, engage funders and to show and impact giving. I really think we need to think about impact giving. And what I mean is program related investments using loans from funders to help fund your organizations when you're in trouble. This creates impact and helps build capacity of your organization. And like Eric, I just would like to leave us with a quote by Darren Walker, who's the CEO of the Ford Foundation. He says, let us be righteous optimists as we stand before unprecedented challenges and let us do everything we can to bend the moral arc of the universe toward the better end. Thank you. Didn't I say this is a dream team? It's so wonderful to hear from all of you. And I know we have a few questions. So I will turn it over to Jamie Felipe, who's the vice president of the Alfred Group to facilitate our question and answer time. Thank you, everybody. 
Great, thank you so much. One of the questions that was submitted has to do with the societal shifts going on right now and the importance of focusing on racial and diversity, equity and inclusion. How will the focus on this impact fundraising and philanthropic support and philanthropic direction? Um, Eric, may I call on you first? Sure. Uh, a, fo a focus on, um, you know, one of the things in our strategic plan, we talk about health equity. Um, and and we, we do have to recognize that um, there, there are racial tensions uh, as part of our complicated history here in America. I believe a focus on uh, racial equity will ultimately improve, first of all, life for all, um, and particularly in philanthropy. Now, there's going, to be, there's going to be a need for a great deal of education about how we got here uh, and about how uh, what we funded and how we have even behaved as philanthropy over the past 50 years. It really does um, perpetuate in some ways uh, what, what we have seen in, in terms of, of inequities and, and health inequities and other inequities. So a focus on it. I don't know. I don't know the impact. Maybe Brian or Julie can speak more about the impact in terms of giving. But I'll say, from an impact and on the ground perspective, um, life will be better as we look holistically across all people and people groups and the most disinvested and historically most disinvested people groups, and begin to focus on equity and not just equality, giving everybody the same thing in this moment. There's a need for equity, which means there may be some unbalanced giving, but that unbalanced giving takes into account the constructions from the past. And so I think our sector philanthropy is poised and positioned to lead, lead that charge. Great. Julie, would you like to add to that? Eric's always so eloquent. I would mm. say it's time for the foundation sector to do our work differently. We have to share the power. We have to be more diverse. And we really have to listen, 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 and get more proximate to the issues. Um, I guess that's all I can really say. It's about giving a seat at the table for those who know the issues. You know, Darren Walker, the Ford Foundation, uh, one of the largest foundations in the country, he's actually put his grantee partners on the board, two of them, Brian Stevenson from Equal Justice Initiative and Ajin Poe from the Domestic Workers Alliance. That is, was unheard of anywhere. And I think we need to consider that. Are our boards diverse? Are our staffs diverse? Are we really allowing people of color to um, have the kind of equity that Eric talks about in promoting them, even with our not, within our impact organizations? Thank you. Brian or Sarah, would you like to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, coming right off of what Julie mentioned, um, there's quite a movement in the investment world to focus on ESG, environmental, social, and governance. And one of those things that really adds to a good score on ESG is how diverse the board is and how diverse your senior management is. Mm -hmm. and, um, more, and we're seeing more and more that companies, this is, this is maybe surprising for some folks, companies who show regular improvement on these scores um, see their stock growing more. So you want to have a good economic reason to, to add diversity to your board. There it is. There's also more, in, and by the way, in the last few years, um, those have been the best performing stocks across the board as well, not universally. But in general, if you had more ESG in your portfolio over the last few years, you did better than if you didn't. So, um, you know, there, there's already quite a movement. I don't think we're there yet, but there's quite a movement in board diversity. Um, given uh, the success of those stocks, given the popularity of them, I think um, even if just motivated by capitalism, um, boards of directors and CEOs are going to say, yeah, we need to do more of that. And, and that might not be the way you want it done, but it'll get done that way. And that's good for everyone. Right. 
anecdotally we're seeing in the philanthropic press and hearing from our, our participants in the fundraising school that this conversation around uh, social justice, how our organizations um, are, how we do or do not reflect the communities that we serve uh, and how we're engaging donors in those conversations and donors who are ready to have those conversations or want to begin begin that conversation with our organizations. We're, we're, seeing, we're seeing that, we're hearing that kind of on the ground. Um, so thinking about our work in that way, I think is, is uh, as Sharon said earlier, this is an inflection point for philanthropy. And I think that this national renewed consciousness about social justice is exactly that inflection point. There's another question from a participant about advocacy. And this really has to do about funding. The person said, in the past, a lot of funders do not give money towards advocacy efforts. The person wants to know, do you think this is changing? I, I would say yes, it is changing, Jamie, and to the person who asked the question. Um, and for many foundations like ours, a private foundation or independent private foundation, we have to be extremely careful, and, and any, in, any philanthropic agent has, has to be extremely careful to define advocacy and education uh, in, as opposed to lobbying where you are right. speaking specifically of a candidate or a specific piece of legislation, vote, thumbs up or thumbs down. Advocacy in its true nature is informing and it is, an edu and it is educating. And that's from the people, the grassroots, to the policy makers. It's, it's, everyone is educated about the same thing. I do believe foundations and other grant makers, philanthropists are looking at that, that model of advocacy and how that can continue. And actually, I, I would say advocacy, um, not above grant making, but it is one of the tools in the toolbox that foundations, we have to pay attention to because advocacy and giving voice, not giving voice, the voice is already there, removing the barriers that the voice of community already has, that is a role that foundations can play. And nonprofit or impact partners, I think that was the term, Julie, that you have now coined, mm -hmm. um, these impact partners, they, they are interfacing with the community and I do believe it's incumbent upon foundations to resource that voice. I'd like to just add to that as well. I think as particularly in affinity groups and um, helping, that's a way of building capacity and changing things systemically. And it's driven by data too at times. I mean, we created this funding alliance among uh, funders of women and girls in the state of Florida. We brought them all together, the Florida Women's Funding Alliance. We commissioned a report on the status of women in Florida by county. And once we had that, we could change the way things were done, change policy. To me, advocacy is just a way of changing policy and giving voice to the movement, like Eric said. Great. I think it is time for us to close out the Q&A and I would turn it back over to Lucinda um, to bring us to closure and share some additional information. Lucinda? Absolutely. Wow, that was such a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much to all of the panelists. Informative and inspirational. Uh, and thank you so much to the Community Foundation uh, for hosting uh, this with us. Um, what, a, what a great event. I just wanted to close out with a couple of details and webinar wrap up logistics. Uh, so first of all, we recorded this webinar. So keep an eye out for an email from the Alfred Group that will have the full recording. Uh, feel free to use that as reference or send it to family and friends um, or board members, whoever you think would be interested in this information. Uh, we will also share select Giving USA slides from Sharon's presentation. Uh, we are unable to share all of the data that will need to be purchased through Giving USA. However, we're very happy to share our discount code with you. So if you go to givingusa.org, uh, and make your purchase online, you can use our discount code, which is Alford, A-L-F-O-R-D, and receive 30% off all Giving USA 2020 products. Another reminder, this webinar is approved for 1.5 credit points towards your CFRE certification or recertification, so please take advantage of that. And if we didn't have a chance to answer your question today, or if you have other comments, 
we would love to keep this conversation going. So here on your screen is the best way to reach the Alfred Group and the Community Foundation. Please reach out to us. We would love to hear from you. Um, and we hope, we hope to keep this conversation going. Vicki, did you want to say anything else before I, I wrap us up? Oh, I think you're on mute. Oh, Vicki, we still can't hear you, unfortunately. <laughs> She's waving goodbye. So I'll wrap us up. Thank you so much. We're going to conclude today's session. Uh, thank you for joining. We're now going to disconnect. And I hope that everyone has a really, really great day. Take thank care. you, everyone.